We'll be looking at salvation, the doctrine of salvation. Praise the Lord. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Paul speaking to Timothy. He says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. In verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, I said on Sunday that, you know, salvation is based on what the scriptures teach. And many times, um, people try, try to superimpose their own uh, uh, experiences. And you have people talk about visions, somebody's heavenly appearance, or stuff like that, you know, but... The only proof of salvation is the scriptures. And that's why you must know what the Bible says. And that's vital. That you know what the Bible says about salvation. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm going to talk about this. And um, I, I said this on Sunday too, that, you know, the scriptures never contradict itself. Sometimes the grammar may be what we don't understand. At times, there, 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 there's, a, there's a particular word, for instance, that was translated as if in the Greek, from Greek to English, that means since. Imagine if you translated that properly, um, uh, you know, if we died with him, we shall reign with him, that what is since we died with him. Imagine if that should change the whole equation, then you will not think that there is a contradiction somewhere. But many times, because of lack of study, we think... There is a contradiction. There's no contradiction in the Bible. It's just a contradiction, I told you on Sunday, in your mind. There could be a contradiction in your understanding, but there is a clear cut. Now, I'll tell you something. If the Bible says something in one verse, that is the superintending truth in the whole Bible. Sometimes when we think you say something else, somewhere else, is because we don't have an understanding. Now, I'll say, I'll say this. In any subject matter, because it's a Bible study, uh, in any subject matter, when you have a, uh, uh, an overwhelming evidence on a fact, for instance, if you have some about um, the deity of Jesus, for instance, and you have 18 scriptures about the deity of Jesus, and they see one that seems to look like it might not be deity. You see, that one doesn't contradict. That one just needs understanding and clarification. Praise the Lord. That one is not contradicting it. It just needs a clarification. There's a verse of scripture. Jesus says that there's none, don't call me good. For there's none good but God. So do you see what I'm saying? Is not God. Where he also said, glorify me. You know, he says he's not God. Where he says, no man knew the hour, not the sun, not the angels in heaven, just the father. See, he's not God. But I've, I've, I've clarified that for you, right? Have I done that for you? Praise God. So there's no contradiction. It's just contradictions in your mind. 1996, I think, I took a series on contradictions of the Bible. I think about, I, I took over 500 contradictions that people think are in the Bible. 1996 or seven, one or two years. And I took people through that in the Bible. Praise the Lord. Then one day we will have time to do that. That was when we were younger. We will have time with, for God then. Amen. If you call the meeting in the morning, they will show up. You don't write your letters, they can't attend. Amen. Because <laughs> I can do 500 contradictions in the Bible. That would take like a, 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 a two, three years with the way we do our services now. Is that not true? Huh? But these are important things you need to know because they affect your faith. Is that true? Huh? Yes. Alright, so there are no contradictions. When you find an overwhelming evidence, for instance, about the subject of study, um, then you, you need to Stick with that overwhelming evidence to explain. I always say, um, take, for, move from the known to the unknown. The known will always explain the unknown. That is, some verses are very clear. Okay, those ones now explain the unknown to you. And oftentimes, when you are, when you have a proof text of a scripture, or uh, in a scripture, a proof text of a concept, always look at the grammatical meaning of that proof text. For instance, most of us uh, rely on John three for. The new birth. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But there is, um, the, the, the language there makes clarification. Because the word again in common English means the second time. But the language in John 3 3 is not the second time. You still there? Are you still there? So, 
whenever you have a proof text of something, you need to clarify the language. Because the word again there means new. Something that is new doesn't mean it's again. But the, the, only, the only language that could translate will be the word again. And then you have next verse 12. Verse 5 is that man is born of water, you know, uh, uh, that is uh, and the spirit. Remember, years ago I had a problem. Uh, it was 94. I was in a Bible study and then uh, a lady of deaconess in the church. I used to teach in a white garment church. Praise God. <laughs> I did a series of Bible teaching for them months. I would preach at their convention. I was even, I drafted the Bible study. Amen. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I told, the woman said, well, that's about the water. I said, no, it's not. So I wriggled my way out of that, that day, but I discovered I didn't really understand John 3 5. So I was doing my study and, and I was reading. And the Lord told me, read it again. Because all of us think the Lord will be telling you meanings. <laughs> read it again. I read again and again and I saw, of water, and the, it didn't put the word the before water. So that made sense to me. Because that's a break in the phrase, okay? So I said, oh, there must be something about this statement. Until later I looked at the word and. Because I thought the word and is a conjunction that we use normally when you say Jack and Jill. Right? That's Jack plus Jill. But and in the Greek could just mean that is. Or speaking of the word K-I-K-I, Kai, Kai, that is, that's why we have the name of um, uh, um, uh, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the flesh of the Holy Spirit. People think it's talking about the Trinity. No, it's talking about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is the love of God. That is the communion of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the word that is, that is, that is. Amen. Are you still there? So, you know, I, the, the grammatical context is important so that you will not lose out what it's saying. So that's why it's good to, to know the language that has been used. Okay, I'll give you one instance now that, uh, why am I saying this? Because someone asked me this question and I, I answered the person. I felt the person may not be able to hold a Bible story for you, so it's better that I explain it. Um, the person had um, a series we're taught and he said um, there's a verse of scripture that wasn't clear, Hebrews 12. I'll give you an example of, you know, some of these things that you may need some technical expertise to understand. Now, everybody knows that God is good. James 1.17 says, uh, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the world, from fire of life, from the rivers, and shadow turning. And Jesus showed us who the Heavenly Father is. In Luke 11.11, 11, he says, um, hey, which one of you, you know, uh, will his son ask of him of, of bread, and is going to give him a stone, or fish, is going to give him a scorpion. And he says, uh, if you've been able to know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give good gifts to them, you know, who are his kids in the kingdom, and, and say, things like that. So, Jesus makes a distinction between the Heavenly Father and the Earthly Father, and he says to give good things. But I also Hebrews 12, and um, the person asks this question, I'm just going to clear that on the issue of language. Praise the Lord. If you think I'm fast, then you're just, you're just in service, because I'm going fast. Hebrews 12 and 5. So that you have forgotten, right? You, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art, rebu- thou art rebuked of him. Okay? For whom the Lord loveth, he chast- chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. How many of you like this verse? Hallelujah. You don't seem to like it, right? So the person asks him a question, and I say, well, um, we, we got to a study, so that's what I'm going to look at. So we have, the, it, there's a grammatical issue here, for instance, in this verse, because um, the word he uses here is strong. He says, the verse 6, He whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. Now the word scourges there, I tried to years ago, because um, I tried to find out, maybe it's not literal, <laughs> Maybe it's metaphoric or what else do we say? Huh? Oh, well, that's one. <laughs> it's an hyperbole. <laughs> but it is not. It's a literal statement. And I checked the meaning of the word scourge, and I found out it was used in other places, Second Corinthians eleven twenty four, used for Paul and Acts called scourge. Second Corinthians eleven twenty four. And I discovered that this scourge here even if you were to use it metaphorically, um, it's not so good a metaphor, because it, the word scourge there has to do with the Roman soldiers and the way they, they, they applied the whip you know, on the prisoners. And of course, when scourge 
that was scourging, as was never used between two people that had a familial relationship. It was always used for prisoners and used for those who were, were it was used for punishments. And I wondered that if you, that cannot be, then I felt that this cannot be a proper uh, a metaphor because you can't use a metaphor for a prisoner and a prison owner um, for a father and a son. Are you still following what I'm saying? That's a strange metaphor. And then, if that's, that's if it's a metaphor at all, because it's not it's actually a literal word uh, used in here. Then I also discovered that it was used for Paul as a prisoner. Then John 19, John 19, verse 1, it was used for Jesus. You have seen Passion of Christ before. So I'm close to that. You know, scourged him. And I discovered that that, that, that scourge sometimes, it involves, you know, having... In those days, some, some broken elements, metal. Uh, in fact, some versions say it has uh, scorpions, you know, involved in what they did. And I wondered why would the father pick this kind of metaphor? You know, when the father loves, he, he weeps like a prisoner. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I've seen people use this to talk about the bad experiences they have in life. And they say God's trying to train them, he's trying to bring them up into glory, he's trying to teach them what to do and stuff like that. But um, again, like I said, it's a proper, it's a lack of use of language, um, the kind of language that was used. So normally, in Bible interpretation, listen now, when you see a statement quoted from somewhere, go back to where it was quoted from. So I took a tour to where it was quoted from. I know I've explained this in one of the series. Which is it that? When you're destiny in God or something? I think so, All right. Um, Proverbs chapter 3 is where this was quoted from. Proverbs 3. Amen. Now, are you in a hurry? Don't be. Because I want us to learn together. So, put your hands in Hebrews 12 and let's see. Something is missing there. It says, my son, this statement was picked from Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Am I correct? Am I correct? Okay, now, I want you to pay attention now, because in Bible study, you got to pay attention. Okay? So that you don't miss out. Like I said, sometimes the contradiction may be because of, you don't understand the grammar that was used. So let's look at it together. Verse 11, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Because it's forget not the exhortation. That means something had been written before, right, that you should not forget. So it's correct to say this was quoted from Proverbs 3. Come on. Come on, guys. Are you together? All right, now see. So let's see this as a direct quotation from Proverbs 3. So let's see now. Hebrews 2, 5. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. So we're correct. So tick that. That's that's okay. Tick it. You got to tick it. Let me know it. Tick it. Is that it? Okay, let's look at the second one. Neither be weary of his correction. All right? Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Correct. Is that correct? They mean the same thing. Right? So are we still together? Fine. Now look at 6. Now go back to um, verse 12. Let's see verse 12 together. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrects. Let's see. For whom the Lord loveth, he what? He chastens. This is what the chastening is a party. It means to correct by instruction, by rebuke. Correct? Is that still a correct translation? Sorry? Am I fast? Huh? I'm not fast. Just want to be out of here. Amen. Okay. I'm out of this verse. That's what I mean. <laughs> okay, the next one. Even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Let's see verse 2. Verse 12. For whom the Lord loveth and chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Is that still correct? 
Is that still correct? Come on. Is that still correct? <laughs> I thought we were reading this thing together. Is that still correct? Would you say that verse 12 is exactly verse 6? What's different there? Huh? The word cogis was never from that verse. <laughs> Hallelujah. See there? Are you following me now? It was never from that verse. So I began to wonder what happened. You know, what, what could have happened in this verse? Now, anytime you're reading the Bible, there are two things that should guide you. Number one, um, there is a revelation of the Father, that's God, that was given to us by Jesus. Okay, that's the exact representation of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, God was sundry times in diverse manners, spoken time past to our fathers about the prophets, but in these last days, verse 2, he spoke in his Son. So Jesus is, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Verse 9, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus has a revelation of the Father that cannot be faulted by anybody. Agree with me? Do you agree with me? Good. Now, so that's one. Two, when you see that in the overwhelming evidence of the scriptures, it doesn't sound like God. Come on. You we together here? It doesn't sound like God. So because it's a punishment that is vested on prisoners, I told you. It's never done to someone you have a familiar, family relationship with. So, I discover where did the problem come from? Now, listen now. In the translation of the Bible, there is a, a, a translation called the Septuagint. You know what that is? Septuagint? Forgotten quickly? What's Septuagint? Huh? The Greek translation of the Hebrew. Right? That is the Greek Hebrew. Now, this was taken from the Septuagint because um, the King James was they took a lot of uh, a lot of the verses from the Septuagint and in language transliteration many times listen now and this is important this is important many times certain words their meanings are lost just like here this this is a case of something lost in translation that is in translating it something was lost obviously if you read it, if you were to pick Proverbs 3, verse um, 11 and 12, and you read that into Hebrews chapter 12, I don't know what they're following me here. If he endures chastening correction, God deals with you as with sons. And but what son is he whom the father chastening? He says, but why does he do all this? Verse 11 will tell you. It says that afterwards it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness, thereby unto them which are thereby exercised. Thereby exercised. So that means this one, it brings forth a fruit of righteousness. Something's going to happen after. Just like I told you in John 15. Oh, sorry, that will be um, the leadership training program now. Uh, John 15, it says, uh, a, a branch that does not bring forth fruit, it does what? Huh? It takes away. All right, we think it means it, it takes away and throws into hell. <laughs> no, it takes away to do what? To bring back again. Remember that? It takes it away to bring it back. That's what he said there. So, because the Father doesn't take away. If you are in Him, it can't be taken away. But when you don't bear fruit, I says that, um, you, I am the branch, and you are the branch. So, if you understand that language, the take away would not be take away to cast away. It's take away, right? To what bring back in. And I explained that to you in that class. So just that same grammar is lost here. So get back again to Proverbs 3. Let's see. It says, For whom the father loves, he corrects. Even as a father, the son in whom he is pleased. The son in whom he is pleased. It didn't add the word scourge. Because the word scourge is not in the original where this was taken from. So it was lost in the translation. 
Let me see your hand. Follow me. Oh, come on. Let me see your hand. Is that clear? Okay. So when you find all those folks who say God is sovereign, does anything that he likes, including scourging his children, tell them they're talking about the devil. Is that clear? So let me give you how it should sound grammatically correct. It should be, For whom the father loves, he instructs just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Is that clear? Just as a father, a son in whom he delights, in whom he receives. So the word scourge is there. It's not there. For whom the father loves, just, just as a father, that's what every son whom he receives. Do you understand that? Sorry? Am I communicating? Is that clear to all of you? All right. Come on. Is it clear? Everybody now, is it clear? Huh? So that's the way grammar can, you can misinterpret it. Because I know, I even, the devil asked me that question, she, sorry, went for a seminar, that was a theme. How God deals with us so many to punish us, I said, they all got it wrong. <laughs> if you just knew the original language, you will not use that for a theme, because the language didn't come from God. Was God in that meeting? Ask them. Praise God. Alright. So, the father does not scourge his sons. Alright? See that? He corrects. The word there, because the word scourge is out of context. Because we're talking about correction and the word, um, chasteneth mean to, means to speak to, to correct. Now the, and the father's corrections are always positive. Still there? Because it, it will bring forth what? Peaceable food of righteousness. They are always positive. All scriptures are given for correction that the man of God may be what? Perfect. See? Correction always has perfect. You will grow. Okay? So it's never negative. So the scourging, and I don't know anybody who was scourged in the Bible that became positive. Jesus and Paul. They didn't become stronger people after, did they? The correction will always make you better. Is that clear? So that's grammar now. So if you lose the grammar in the, in the, in the proof of the text there, you will lose the meaning. Praise the Lord. Would you ask questions like this more? So if you, the, 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 there are no contradictions, it's just clarification that you need. Praise the Lord. Say, say, am I communicating? Sure. You did get it? You got it? Because it was quoted from somewhere. So in the translation, something was lost. Something was probably added. <laughs> the word God was never there. Clear? Yeah? Thank you. Right, let's go on. So, in the story of salvation, we could, have, we could face certain things like that, that um, will appear like there's a contradiction to the character of God that was revealed to us in the Scriptures. But it's not like that. It's just a question of doing a proper study. And many people are very lazy. They just, well, you know, you know that's what he's talking about. You know, that, and and they, they just forget to really study to find out what he's saying. Praise the Lord. Are still there? All right. So, we said that salvation is God's work. Remember that? Huh? It's God's work. Is that clear? Was that clear to you on Sunday? That's God's work. It's God's work. And we saw why it's God's work. Because we said, what happened to man in the garden? Remember? I said, Adam, where are you? That's what? Separation. Have you, he, uh, uh, he, I heard your voice and I hid. There was, that's what? Guilt. And what else? He said, uh, um, uh, have you eaten that which I said should not eat? Condemnation. Then you're cursed. That is what judgment. Then Genesis 5, uh, verse 3, he gave us the son by the name of uh, Satan. And that's what? Condition. So we see that man, conditionally, cannot approach God and be accepted of God. Uh, uh, Isaiah 64 verse 6, it says all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Uh, Romans 3 from 10 uh, tells you that there's nothing man's going to do. Verse 19, he cannot speak right, he cannot think right, he cannot act right. So nothing will come from man that will save man. See that? So salvation, Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, is of the Lord. This is chapter 2 verse 1. He says, you, I think, quick and we'll t- just tell us and see, you know, where you walk out because of this world. 
Not even about our power here. The spirit that now walks the joy of the disobedience, among whom we all have a covenant time past. He says he's fulfilling the desires of uh, the flesh, and uh, by nature, to rather than others. See, but God, verse 4, who was rich in mercy, is the salvation. God, 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 Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua. It means salvation is of the Lord. That's what it means. Salvation, the word Jesus. Yeshua, Yeshua, it means salvation is of Yahweh. You can save yourself. That's why the metaphors used for a man who is spiritually, who is spiritually dead is dead. He's dead. So if he's dead, he has to be raised from the dead. He needs to just respond. He cannot be raised by himself. So salvation is of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Are you seeing that? The love of the Lord. So that's good. So we said, there are certain concepts that speak of salvation. And we saw the concept of reconciliation. Can you remember that? Now we said, the Greek word reconciliation is the word katalasso. Remember that? Romans 5 and 10. Run there quickly. Katalasso. Romans 5 and 10. We're not getting today's teaching now. That's today's teaching. Romans 5 and 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verse 11. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have now received what? Huh? Thank you. Reconciliation. Catalasso. Wrongly translated as Antonio. We have received what? The reconciliation from God. Because we said reconciliation was initiated from God. Now, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Why are we going to these concepts? These concepts explain salvation to us. So if you don't understand what kind of salvation you have received, check these words. These words explain exactly what you have in Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and then verse 18. He says, God... Verse 18, it says, And all things of God, who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and have given to us the mystery of reconciliation, to which God was in Christ. Notice the mystery of the gospel is called the ministry of reconciliation. What is that ministry? It says a word of reconciliation. What kind of word? It says in verse 19, God was in Christ. Doing what? Reconciling the world unto himself, and not imputing their trespass unto them. That means in reconciliation, he is not bringing guilt against anybody. It is not bringing sins against anybody. Why? Because the word catalasso means to bring to yourself. Now, that shows that God initiated it. Why? Because salvation is of the Lord. God initiated it. He didn't just initiate it. He also effected it. He didn't just effect it. He also gave a message for it. He gave a message. He had ministers to do it. So, it's a God work. And it's a God's work. It's a God work. A God efficacy in reconciliation. Now, in case you don't understand what I just said, there's another word that we use. Colossians 1, 20, 21. Paul uses a stronger word there. Colossians 20. No, sorry, it's Colossians 1, 20 and 21. Paul says, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him. So, reconciliation deals with what? We said peace. Remember that? Right? Peace. Being justified by faith. Romans 5 1. We have what? So, reconciliation deals with what problem of the sin of man? It's just Sunday. Huh? Separation. Reconciliation dealt with the separation problem. Now, man left the garden. Man moved from God. But in reconciliation, God goes to man. So, it's not a case of I just want to be where you are. No, he came to where we are. So there is no distance because of the reconciliation. Because there is a catalasso, there is no, di- there is no separation. <laughs> so what we have is a catalasso. Paul now is a stronger word. He says to reconcile all things. Watch this now. Unto himself by him I say, it says, whether there are things in heaven or on earth, and verse 21, you were sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by your wicked works, you are now, what? Reconciled. Catalasso. The word here is asso. 
He has a word there. Now, why did Paul say apokatalasso? The word apokatalasso means completely reconciled. Completely reconciled. That means there is no way this reconciliation can change. Apokatalasso was the word he used. He used it again in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 15. What does it say? It says, Having a boy in his flesh, he had with even the law of commandments contained ordinances, for to making himself a toy, one new man, so making peace, that he might make reconciled both unto God in one body by the cross, glory to God, having slain the enemy to thereby, the word reconciled there is apocatalasso. It means it's a permanent, once and for all reconciliation. I know many folks in the denominations don't like the word once and for all, the word forever. I tell them, get used to it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Reconciliation once and for all. That's what God says. So he says, you know, why, why is it apokatalasso? It's very simple. There's another word in the Greek used for reconciliation. And that's the word dialasso. D-I-A-L-L-A-S-O. Now, dialasso means, what die will mean what? Two. Two people coming together. Now, if two people come together, two people can go away. They are lasso. Use in First Corinthians seven eleven. And of course, it's talking about marriage there. <laughs> Amen. First Corinthians seven eleven. But if, if she depart, let her be known by or unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So that's the case where somebody can be put away, use that lasso. But he doesn't use that lasso for Christianity or for salvation. He uses the word apokatalasso or the word katalasso. That is, God keeps coming to you. See that? God keeps coming to you. It has nothing to do with what you did. It's what he does is the reconciliation. Are you still there? Are you still there? So it's what he does that is the reconciliation. Now what you do. Now in that lasso is what you both do. But in the reconciliation of our salvation is what only God does. So God is the only one who reconciles. Romans, Romans 5, while we're what? Yet sinners. God will not impute their treasures again unto them. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. You get this now? So people in their minds, when they're talking about salvation, what's in their mind is that lasso. Remember I told you on Sunday? Remember? What is Sunday? Sorry, that's it. Said he chose you. I choose you again and again. You're lying. Said you did not choose me. I chose you. You were chosen before the world began. Someone chooses you before you were born. The world you do after being born that will make him not choose you. He didn't just choose you because he was trying to make a choice or trying to think what he was going to choose. He had foreknowledge. So there's nothing you do about do that I didn't know, but he had chose you. Amen. Till I'm there, show that on Sunday. Remember that on Sunday? He chose you in him for the foundation of the world that you should be holy and blameless before him in love. It's his choice. Something is his choice. So there's a dialogue. So what's your choice again? Remember those words. We're going to use many Greek words here now. So dialogue means only God came. So we can move with God's coming. Keep with God's coming. God's coming. God's coming. It's not two people coming together. It's one person coming to the person. And don't forget, we were the enemies. We were the sinners. We were the guilty party. He is a righteous and holy one, but he came or comes after us. See that? So God so loved the world, John 3, 6, that he what? Gave. He loved the world and he gave. Hallelujah. See that? Amen. We have a lot of songs against the world. I'll never, never go back to the world. He says, go into all the world. Read the gospel to every creature. Amen. <laughs> the second word we're going to examine is the word propitiation. Put it on Sunday. Propitiation. Propitiation. Propitiation is P R O T A T I O N. P R O P I T A T I O N. Propitiation. See that word used severally 
in the scriptures. You know, one of the things we said about God's character is that God is what? Holy. Did I explain the word holy to you on Sunday? Huh? Remember that? What's holy? Huh? Separate from us. Okay? Separate from man. That's what the holy it doesn't mean what we think holy is in so many places. <laughs> it's separate from. That's what it is. Now, let me show you a portion of scripture again that has a language barrier. Should I show you again? Okay, that's it. First Peter 1. I know you know this verse very well. Verse 15. But as he that has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all matter of conversation. Are you there? Well, it is written. You preached this before. Be ye holy for I am holy. And I'm telling you something that's, that's, and I told you that Christianity is not impersonating Jesus. Remember that? <laughs> Say, be ye holy, for I am holy. What's God say? God is saying, be like me. <laughs> Did you ever imagine that? <laughs> How can God say, be like me? <laughs> That's too much for you. Where is God? Be as who, who be like me. He didn't say that. That's not what he said. Be holy, for I am holy. Where was this taken from again? Leviticus. Leviticus now. Praise the Lord. 11, uh, 44. Imagine if you did not read First Peter 1, 15 and 16. Take it away from your mind. Now you do that now. Delete, delete, delete. Leviticus 11 now. You there? I'm not there myself. Are you there? 44. Let's go. I am the Lord your God. Uh, I am what? The Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Verse 5, 45. For I am the Lord that brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall be holy, for I am holy. What are you saying? <laughs> What is he saying? He commanded them to be holy. <laughs> what is he saying? Because he is the God, they are holy. But he's not. <laughs> he is ready. Be like me. No, that's not what he's saying. Because I am your God, be holy. No. Uh-huh. Because I am your God, you are holy. I brought you out. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that's why he called them a holy nation. See that? It's not commanding holiness. It is, it is invoking holiness. That I am the Lord your God. Be holy for I am holy. So he calls them a holy nation. You are holy unto me. You are separated unto me. I, that is, I, I separate you unto myself. So cleanse yourself guys. Praise the Lord. That's why First Peter 1, 15. I'm not fast am I? He says, Be ye holy in all manner of conversation, for he which calls you is holy. That's why it tells in chapter 2, verse 9, you are a holy nation. See that? So there was not an instruction to be holy. It was an evocation of holiness. He's called you to himself, so you are holy. So that therefore, you in your lifestyle act who you are. Praise the Lord. But if you've had sermons on this verse 16, it's as though it wasn't quoted from somewhere. Are you lonely? Sometimes it means be lonely. Amen. Propitiation. So God is holy. Agree? Right? And because he's holy and separate from sinners, because he's holy and separate from man, he will not tolerate sin. So that on Sunday, right? 
He's a righteous judge. Remember that? He's a righteous judge. He will say, oh, you know, uh, I feel you, I feel you. Uh, you. You seen it, right? I feel you, I feel you. Then he says, okay, I'm a, I was angry last night, but I'm okay now. I'm cool, I'm cool. And, you know, let, let's just act like nothing happened. No, he's a righteous judge and he's a holy. So we will have to be just. Okay? So, in being righteous and being holy, there will be a need for a propitiation. There must be a propitiation. So, First John chapter 2, verse 1. If any man sin, if any man sin, it says we have an advocate with the Father. Remember that? Jesus Christ the righteous. And it is what? The pro- is what? It is a propitiation for our sins. When you hear propitiation, it always speaks about sins. Reconciliation deals with distance. Remember that? Propitiation deals with the act. It is a propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for of the whole world. What propitiation? First John 4.10. John uses it twice. First John 4.10. He said, <clears throat> and his love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation again for our sins. So when you say the word propitiation, it means sins. The word propitiation is the Greek word elasmos. I'll spell it for you. Not that Hilarious. Or Galistus. H-I-L-A-S-M-O-S. Elasmos. It means satisfaction. So take the word propitiation and put the word satisfaction. Jesus is the satisfaction for our sins. That clear? Satisfaction of what? Satisfaction of God's holiness. Satisfaction of the righteous judgment of God. Sin was not overlooked. There was a propitiation. There was a satisfaction. To satisfy his holiness. Still there? Are you still there? So sin was not overlooked by God. I get you. It's all right. It's fair. It's cool to... I understand what you look like. I understand what you feel like. He didn't say that. He was satisfied by Jesus. He is a propitiation. And I tell you this. That what Jesus did to save mankind... Happened from when he died. So from the point of his death to his resurrection, we find the propitiation. Now I told you, the propitiation of Jesus, listen now, it is a, it was the propitiation. It says he is the propitiation at the right hand of the Father. That means, and I told you this, I told you this many times, Jesus' sacrifice of redemption was not when he died was not when he was buried. It was when he was raised from the dead. Because, or like the old covenant, listen now, what was presented for this covenant is a living sacrifice. A sacrifice with an everlasting covenant. See that? That's why his blood is called an indestructible, everlasting blood. Okay? Listen now, you follow what I'm saying? So, Jesus' satisfaction of the Father, don't forget, when he died, he rose from the dead, he saw Mary. And Mary wanted to hold him. He said, hold me for no longer. Mary held him. And he said, I go to my Father, your God, your Father, my God and your God. Ascend to my father. So he ascended. Hebrews tells us that that was when he became the high priest. Then he did not present blood. He entered by himself. Amen. If he went to heaven dead, then he will have followed the priesthood of Aaron. But he went to heaven alive. Hallelujah. He went to heaven alive to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. So that's where he became what? The Elasmos. Just like the, we're going to see that, the, the, the Day of Atonement. There's a ship, I'm oh, sorry, that's a ship. 
there's a goat that is presented alive. So it goes alive. The two, it dies, then it goes alive. So Jesus goes alive in the heaven. He's raised from the dead. That's why the Bible says his priesthood is continuing because he lives. Do you understand that? His priesthood continues because by the reason of death, those under Aaron were stopped, but his priesthood continues. So his priesthood is that propitiation. We're going to see that in a moment. His priesthood is that propitiation. What makes a high priest a high priest is what? The propitiation. What he brings into, into, into the temple. If he comes to the temple and then he brings in fried rice. It's going to be fried rice and his meat. See, Heavenly Father, I just feel that, you know, you, you're a cool person, you're a good God. You know, I've been told by people that you're a loving God. You know, someone said, say, God is love, so nobody's going to hell. I said, love will see you in hell. <laughs> so, so, you know, God is love, so he brings a nice KFC, rice. I like KFC too much. Um, White House. <laughs> Nipples beef. The Heavenly Father just bring this here. He's going to add his own meat there. Because he's going to die. He's a holy God. Okay? So the high priest is a high priest because he brings in what? A propitiation. So Jesus has nobody's blood to offer but his own. And he can't, he can't appear there dead. He has to appear there alive. So he dies. Rises from the dead and goes as the high priest with his own blood into the heavens. So we have an advocate with the Father. Praise the Lord. Is that clear? It's a propitiation not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Amen? Romans 3.25. Elasmos. The word, Romans 3.25 uses the word elasterion. Elasterion means for, or in the place of something. Still the same word, but used differently. Romans 3.25, Elasterion. Look at this. Now, I'll start from 21. I told you, every time you find the word propitiation, it deals with sin. Okay? Now, it didn't say it was the propitiation. Because he's talking to a new creature. He said, he is. That means, when a Christian sees, he is his propitiation. God doesn't look at it and say, all right, you're my son, go away. Uh, there is a propitiation, a satisfaction, that is in heaven with the Father. Still there? Are you still there? Romans 3. 19. We know that what is about the Lord said, it's said to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become what? Guilty before God. So that was what was it for the Lord. Remember? The Lord is the penalty. Remember that on Sunday? Can you remember that on Sunday? Good. 20. And therefore by the deeds of the Lord shall no flesh be justified in his sight, and by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, and for all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's say 24 together. Being freely justified by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 25 now. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Say again. Remission of what? Sins. The word remission is remission. One. Alright? Remission means what? Cancellation. A total taking away off. That's what it is. So, Jesus' blood does not cover sins. The old covenant, bulls and goats covered sins until Jesus' blood will come. Jesus' blood takes away sin. That clear? So there's a mission of sins through faith in his blood. How? By the propitiation. Propitiation through faith in his blood. So there's a satisfaction of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, he says, is a propitiation. And what their propitiation is, elasterion. It means in the place of. In the place of. That shows the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. 
Amen. That means that something stands in a, actually it's like a, it's like to, like a lead over something. That's the one, uh, 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 Rion used there. Sterion, sorry, used there. Like a lead over something. To be over something. Now I'll show you what that means. Hebrews 9 will make it clearer. It was used again in Hebrews 9, 5. Elasterion. Hallelujah. Hebrews 9, 5. We've well, seen this word several times. And I think some folks have used it to dramatize, but this is what it means. Hebrews 9, 5. And over in the characters of glory, oh, shadowing the propitiation. That's what mercy seat. Same word. Elasterion. Of which we can now speak Particularly. Now listen to this. This is important. He's saying that everything that was in the tabernacle was to overshadow, to shadow the propitiation. Now I'll say something to us. Let's look at what was there. That it was to Hebrews 9.5 Symbol Elasterion, propitiation. So let's look at the temple. A bit now. Then very the first covenant and also ordinance of divine service and our worldly sanctuary, there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table, Hebrews 9, and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. Now what we're concerned with now will be the second veil. See that? The second veil. Which is called what? The holiest of all. And that's why Jesus went into the holiest of all. Which had the golden censer and the hack of covenant. Overlaid around about with gold, showing royalty. Where it was the golden pot which had manna. Manna was to speak of revelation. This is only A3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. John 6.32 Put your hands there. John 6.32. Manna. John 6.32. John 6.32. I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he that comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. So that was in the tabernacle. The holiest of all. Had the revelation, the bread. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and, shall be, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. So inside the holiest of all is that revelation of Jesus. That, that revelation of Jesus that makes you not hungry again forever. Amen. Manna was given, was supplied regularly. Jesus is once when you taste of him. He says you will never hunger again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You will never hunger again. That's the tabernacle. So let's see what the proposition does. Is it, and number two. He says, um, what else? He says an Aaron's rod that bought it. And Aaron's rod speaks of his authority as a priest. Okay? So Aaron already speaks of what? Priesthood, a mediator, somebody who stands in behind between God and the sinner. That's Aaron. He said, Aaron's rod that bought it. You see where it bought it? Leviticus chapter 16, number 16, pardon me. Number 16. Firstly, two things is rod that bought it speaks, spoke up. There was judgment in there as well. Number 16 and 17 was where Aaron's rod bought it. Number 16 and 17. Sons of Korah, Dathan, and Abraham, the rebels. Number 16. Then number 17. Israel blossomed. Okay. Are you there? 
Number 17, most importantly. And then he says, speak unto of Israel and take of, of them a rod according to the out of their fathers, so all the princes according to the fathers of their fathers, twelve rods, and thou shalt write every man's name on his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And when they put every rod together, it was Aaron's rod. He says in verse 5, he says, and it shall come to pass the man's rod whom I shall choose, shall bosom. I will make to seize from me the murmurings of children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. Alright, so Aaron's rod was the one that brought it. Amen. Was the one that blossomed. So that rod that brought it was put in the tabernacle, showing the, 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 the exaltation of his office. What was his office? He was a mediator. Aaron's rod that brought it. And also we have the tables of the covenant where the law was written. They were all there. Tables of the covenant. Where the law was written. Now what does that do to us? That's the revelation of God's holiness. I told the law was not an instruction. It was a revelation. Throw it down on Sunday. Second Corinthians chapter 3 tells us that the law is now written on our hearts by the Spirit of God. So that's in the tabernacle. I said, but why? He says, what do they overshadow? They overshadow what? The mercy seat. The mercy seat is the propitiation. Propitiation. So the mercy seat. Now listen now, it's important. The propitiation was represented by the mercy seat. Now, what happened on the mercy seat? The high priest goes like this. He takes the blood into the holiest of all. What, where does he apply the blood? Where you have a, a shed of blood. He puts the blood where? On the mercy seat. Speaking of what? That one day, Jesus will rise from the dead. Hallelujah. He will come into the throne room and he will seat. Hallelujah. Rather than the blood of an animal sitting there, a person will seat. Hallelujah. So it is our propitiation seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Are you still there? The blood sits there. A person sits there. Praise God. So the blood of Jesus is a person. It seeks at the right hand of the Father today. And you know what right hand means by now, don't you? You know that by now, what it means, amen. So it seeks at the right hand of the Father as our propitiation. Overlaid with gold. So it's, it, is, it is a king and he is a priest. Praise the Lord. Still there? So the propitiation is where? In the holiest of all. That's where it matters. The propitiation is where? In the holiest of all. Now where is the holiest of all today? In heaven. Hebrews tells us that. Heaven. Hebrews 10, 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore bread and boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. See that? Where did he go to? Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Verse 23. It is therefore necessary that the personal things in the heavens should be purified with this. But the heavenly things themselves, Hebrews 9, 24, with better sacrifices than this. Let's take verse 24 together. Hebrews 9. Let's go. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. But where? To do what? To appear in the presence of God for us. Praise God. Hallelujah. So that's the holy. It goes into heaven. You know, you go to heaven, dead. It goes into heaven how? Alive. Glory to God. It goes into heaven alive. Praise God. <laughs> so his priesthood is forever. Why? The propitiation is forever. The satisfaction of sins is forever. It's not going to change tomorrow. Praise the Lord. My word folks say today. It's not going to change. Glory to God. Right. The day of atonement, forget now, the blood is the issue in the day of atonement. The blood is the issue in the day of atonement. All the ceremonies is to offer blood. That's all. Everything is to offer blood. Told you before, blood simply means without works. That's what it means. Blood, the whole of Israel, we wait outside. 
Then the high priest will take the blood. Before he enters, you know what he does? He will first of all have a blood bath. He goes in the blood bath. So he goes in gently. And then he has a tie what they call the progerates on his legs. He's like a bell. So if he's still ringing, they are grateful. If he starts ringing, they run away. Hallelujah. No way to go. <laughs> they run away. So that's Jesus. See, he goes to heaven. The high priest goes there with the blood. Why does he go with blood? Because he has to offer for himself. He's a sinner too. Jesus does not carry blood there because he is the offering. Do you understand that? You know, he's got a guy with a blue bowl of blood. He's a... Where is he going to? Heaven. What's in hand? It's blood. No transfusion. Go ahead. <laughs> Jesus appeared in heaven himself. Because God laid a precedence when he made Adam. The word Adam in the Hebrew is blood. So the word blood is man. So the life of the animal was to shadow man. Man's Often, only man's life will satisfy the Holy God. Do you understand that? So that's why the blood of animals was used. Now Jesus goes into heaven alive, a man. Where is blood? Where is God? So how did Jesus have blood when he was raised from the dead? If someone doesn't have blood when he was raised from the dead, he wasn't raised from the dead. He told those guys, he touched me. I got flesh and what? Bones. If you're a scientist, that's flesh and blood. But it's God. He touched me again. Ah, yeah, yeah. He said, okay, uh, we can touch you. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's an open vision. Is that right? Can I have fish, Surya? The fish and bread. Watch him now. Peter said, the bully Peter said, he ate with us many days. He said, I hate the dead man. That would be crazy. So Jesus was alive when he rose from the dead. And he goes bodily. Praise God. So what about his blood that was scattered in the earth? Want to play some? Want to cover some? Cover your head with some? If he was raised from the dead, everything comes together. Hallelujah. His body came together. His body was complete and whole when it was raised. When it's going to heaven, it goes complete. It doesn't go dead or else he died and never rose. It goes alive. So it goes alive. So if it goes alive into heaven, does he present his blood? Sorry? Is he with his blood? So does he go to heaven with his blood? Does he sit down with his blood? Think it's Aaron? Carry blood in the bowl. For who? He is a sacrifice. He is a propitiation. Hallelujah. Is that clear? Okay. So he is a propitiation. He goes in. With what? Bible says it's a blood of an everlasting covenant. Wow. Glory to God. The blood is a blood of an everlasting covenant. You know, Hebrews 12 says it's a blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. And that's how I love interpretation that Abel's blood, Abel's blood cries for vengeance. Jesus' blood is better. It cries for, for what now? Righteousness. In normal Bible interpretation, don't use better that is in your brain. Good, better, best. Me, I never rest. My good is better, my better, best. That's it? Is that correct? Good, better, best. May I never rest. Just lying. You never reach first ten. <laughs> Alright, so what does he do? The word better in the, in, in the book of Hebrews is what? It's a comparison of a type and shadow with the reality. Abel's blood in Hebrews 11 and verse 4 was the animal that he offered. Jesus' blood was himself. 
That's why the blood of Jesus speaks. The blood that Abel, Abel offered is the blood of an animal that was dead. The blood of Jesus is the blood of a man that is alive today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's alive. Amen. So he's, he's alive. Hallelujah. Jesus, God, blood. A man. And that is a propitiation for our sin. Is that clear? For the our sins were the sins of the whole world. Hebrews 10, up there quickly. Hebrews 10 now tells you, what did he do? Verse 10, by the which we were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 11, in every, it says once and for all. Say once and for all. Hallelujah. That's good. He says once and for all. Whatever can be done once and for all, he is once and for all. Hallelujah. What does it say? Verse 11, it's in every priest stands daily. They used to stand. They had a standing ministry. Ministering and offering, offering times what? The same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Let's take verse 12 together. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hallelujah! How else would you offer and sit down if you didn't go into heaven? Amen? So where did he offer the sacrifice? Where did he go into heaven? He offered by doing what? Sitting down? It doesn't mean it goes like this. It goes like this, you know. He offers it like this. The father says, it's okay. Thank you. Then he goes to sit down. The offering is the fact that he sat down. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> what does the blood do? The blood sits on the, that's why it's called the mercy seat. That is the, the propitiation seat. So who sits there now? Jesus sits there. He is the propitiation. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. He sits there. His blood sits there. The sacrifice sits there. Praise the Lord. He is the propitiation. What else does he do? He says, verse 13, from ends with expecting the enemies made his first two. Let's see 14 together. For by all one offering, he has perfected forever. People don't know what the word perfected means. Now, listen, in the old covenant, when the offering is made for a year, the people have a kind of a standing with God. So God will not count the sins against them. But the Bible says it never affected their conscience. They still had a consciousness of sin. But the blood of Jesus, when it is offered, when it was offered, it got us perfect forever. So listen now. The way you were is the way you are. And that's the way you will always be. Perfected by the blood. Hallelujah. Still there? Perfected by the blood. See, I'm perfected by the blood. See, I'm perfected by the blood. So Jesus, how the right hand of the Father, gives us perfection. It gives us perfection. That's why Paul would say, there is therefore no, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I thought Jesus' work is when I see him, then he talks to the Father. Absolute nonsense. He doesn't stand. He seeks. Praise God. <laughs> what happens? When I see him, what happens? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father to ensure the sin never affects my relationship with God. Never. Because he has perfected us forever. What a perfect sacrifice. Hallelujah. So, so folks, imagine the blood of Jesus still requiring confession of sins. Now, confession of sins is not wrong. But confession of sins is not for your relationship with God. It's not wrong. It's not wrong you confess your sins. You're wrong. That makes you feel good. But confession of sins was done by God on his son. The Bible says he laid the shoes of the whole world on Jesus. 
Jesus took the blame. Responsibility does he wear for everybody. So that's why, how does a man come to God? He confesses Christ. Hallelujah. Who is Christ? The one whom God has confessed all our sins on. Hallelujah. That's propitiation. Say God is satisfied. Say God is satisfied. Satisfied with his son. Son is the propitiation. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Still there? Now, in the word, like those words, the last month, the last everyone, one more now. The last Kuma. Amen. <laughs> There's so many Bible studies in this series. Praise the Lord. The last Kuma means to make a propitiation. To make a propitiation. That's what it means. Hebrews 2.11. So Hebrews 2.17. Hebrews 2 17. Talk about Jesus. Wherefore in all things to be hoping to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation, by translation, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You don't make reconciliation for sins. You make reconciliation between people. Do you understand that? So that's back. The word there is the last comma. It is the word taken from the last most, the last You understand that? That word there is to make what? Propitiation. Do you get that now? Reconciliation deals with distance. Propitiation deals with what? We're going to take as much as nine words or eleven words. Amen. Amen. <laughs> get ready for all those kumai, kumai, kumai. So the last kumai means to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's what Jesus did. So Jesus made propitiation for our sins. To make. It means to propitiate. How did he do it? He did it by himself. By the sacrifice of himself. Jesus used nothing to save us. He was a salvation. Where is God? He gave God nothing to save us. He was the one that was given. See that? God gave his son. How did God give his son? God gave his son by his son being the sacrifice for sins. Where is the Lord? Still there? Are you still there? Say God is satisfied. Say God is satisfied. See, John says, if any man sin, he has what? He has what? A sat, a what? An advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Who is the what? Now, we thought the advocate with the Father is somebody who is talking to the Father like a lawyer. And he says, your lawyer is a good lawyer. Who's a lawyer? Jesus is your lawyer. Every time Satan said, bring something against the Father. What do you think the Father is? You think he's one irregular person? So Satan now matters to him. But Satan will come and accuse you. Jesus, what do you say? Jesus says, Satan is on the left hand. He's on the right hand. What does the right hand mean anyway? Huh? Come on. If you understand what right hand means, you will not imagine Jesus and the Father discussing you. What is the right hand? The right hand is a region. Someone who stays in some, another person's stand. That means the Father vacated the throne for the Son. So the Son is not discussing with anybody. He is the propitiation. His advocacy is where he is. By staying, sitting on the right hand of the Father, he has become our advocate. That act of sitting is the advocacy of Jesus. Hallelujah. See that? So it is Jesus. So, that advocacy is the propitiation for our sins. So what is our advocacy? The propitiation. Hallelujah. See, God is not satisfied with your sins... Those of you that I do, God is satisfied with it. I didn't say that. <laughs> He's satisfied with the offering of His Son for our sins. For us to know that He's not talking about our sins before God said. He said, not just our sins, but the whole world. That's why I would tell them in verse 12, 1 John 2, that beats your imagination. Little children, 
your sins are forgiven. How are they forgiven? Because of the legal basis for forgiveness, the proposition of Jesus. Amen. Confession of sins is not a new covenant practice. I taught you that. You get a sins. Um, what's it again? Forgiveness of sins. I almost said remembrance of sins. <laughs> Repentance of sins. Praise the Lord. See that there? So the last command is to propitiate. Now let's see another place it was used. Luke 18. I remember I wrote this out um, on my Facebook post. And that day I felt I didn't explain it too well. Some folks could misunderstand it. The words come out in the book form. Just keep praying. God's going to work a miracle. The book will be out soon. God help us. Look at 18. Look at this one. Look at this, the, the introduction of the statement of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the, the essence of propitiation we're going to see now. Why do they propitiate in Israel? You know, you know why? I tell you the word blood is what? Blood is what? Without works. That is, every time people offer blood is to say, I don't trust myself. It's not me. I don't trust myself. That's what it means. That looks not me. Blood always invokes mercy and compassion. Works and deeds invoke penalty and judgment. Still there? Are you still there? Look at him. And he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Luke 18, verse 9, 10. Two men came to say, come to church to pray. Sorry. Went to the temple to pray. Come on. One was a Pharisee. A Pentecostal. Right? A Pentecostal. A Pentecostal. So. See, that person born again. He said, no, he's not born again. So why is he not born again? So because he's wearing white garment. And you are wearing a suit garment? What difference does he make? No, 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 no. How can that kind of person be a Christian? <laughs> How can you be a Christian? Why well, are you a Christian? Jesus died for my sins. I thought you died for my clothes. <laughs> You're dumb. You don't understand what salvation is. If you do, you just allow the person to just go. Two men went to the temple to pray, one of the Pharisees and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed with God, sorry, with himself. God, I thank you. You know who I am. I know who I am. I don't get you now. What's going on here? <laughs> I know who I am. I'm not like others, you know, <clears throat> extortionists, unjust, adulterous, as though that's all that matters. There are other things. And there are other things. Even as these publicans. There are other things apart from this. You just mentioned three stuff. There are other things. I can imagine the angels chuckles, they get him the least. <laughs> You can't measure up. <laughs> get him the least. If you don't mind him, you only pick three out of 1,600. I never counted them, I'm just saying mine. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the public can stand the fire would not lift up so much his eyes into heaven and smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, O sinner. I tell you this too. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, it would almost never shall be exalted. Now I had a problem with this verse many years back, and I felt you know, it might be merciful unto me, I'm a sinner, and that's all. But I found out there was a wrong placement of the words. So in studying I said, Where were they? Now when you're studying, where are they? They are in the temple. In the temple, you don't go there to just be talking. Are you there? <laughs> so I use the word merciful. The word merciful is the word elaskomai. Be propitiated on me. 
be satisfied. Now, what does he ask of mine? Why? Because he's in the temple. What happened to the temple? He's saying, accept the sacrifice on my behalf. That's the word of last command. I'm not trusting on myself. That's why he's not looking in heaven. He allows the sacrifice to look in heaven. He said, that man is justified. Jesus is not saying, acknowledge you are a sinner, justifies you before God. That's not what he's saying. There's a propitiation that justifies the man. Than the other. That's the word, be merciful. Feel that? Are you still there? So, be propitiated. So, is the, the value of the sacrifice is now the value of our relationship with God. Since that sacrifice is perfect, our relationship with God is perfect. Since that sacrifice is once, our relationship with Father, I will say once, is once and for all. <laughs> Since that sacrifice is forever, we're perfect before God forever. The word perfect there is not mature. It means without guilt. That's what it is. Without guilt. There's nothing is standing against our records. Why? Because of the property issue. We're going to deal with that also. The issue of records. Records here. See that on Sunday. We have another word. We're going to expiate. Redeem. Redemption. We're going to see all those words one by one. Amen. Are you ready? Alright. So, the value of Jesus is the value of the work that was done. And the value of the work that was done is the value of the relationship because of that work. Hallelujah. So I told you one time, so if you preach this, people will see it. I said, tell that to God. People were sinning before Jesus died. But it's God. The good news is what God has done. Hallelujah. To restore fellowship with him. To give us reconciliation. To have a relationship with God. Told you on Sunday. You cannot please God. See, he's God. What do you want to do? God has his prophet. Is he a very smart guy? Is this all the world, Pastor? That's how I'm going to answer your questions from now. And God bless you. <laughs> He says, son of man. If God calls you son of man, you remain a son of man. Can this dry bones leave? They say, the Greek word of leaf is zoipoe. He said, only you. Only you know. Praise God. He said, great. Only God can say. Only God can raise a man from a spiritual death to spiritual life. Only God can restore us to himself. We have nothing to offer but to be beneficiaries of what he has done. Like W. Smith, he said, I am empty handed. I'm alive in your hands. Hallelujah. It's what salvation is all about. It's all about God. What God has done for us. It's not, it's not God plus repentance. It's not God plus tongues. It's not God plus prayer. It's not God plus church attendance. It's God plus God plus God plus God. And we are saved. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God. We're going to examine the word redemption. Let me just run through briefly. Redemption. A salvation is also called redemption. It's called reconciliation. It's called propitiation. It's also called redemption. What redemption? It's not a doctrinal word. <laughs> Exodus 6, 6. Run there quickly. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6. I am the Lord and I'll bring you out from the, he said, from the bondings of the Egyptians. I'll bring you out of their bondage and I'll redeem you with a, a straight out hand. With a great, with great judgments. Exodus 6 and 6. Exodus 15 verse 3. Verse 13, pardon me. It says, That in thy mercy thou hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto their holy habitation. Psalm 74. Praise the Lord. Psalm 74. 
Verse 2. Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed this Mount Zion, when thou hast dwelt. The word to redeem means to purchase. Verse 35. The seventh, seventh, eight, verse 35, pardon me. And they remembered, God who was their rock, the high God, their redeemer. That is the word, their purchaser. The word redemption implies a price, a payment for something. It means to pay. I'm going to give you five words, and then we're going to explain it on Sunday. First word is the Greek word agorazo. A-G-O-R-A. I want to say agorazo. A-G-O-R-A-Z-O. That is R-A-Z-O. Hagorazo is taken from the word Agora. Agora in the Greek means a marketplace. Something purchased in a marketplace. You see that word using 1 Corinthians 6.20? You were bought with a price. To buy in a marketplace. 1 Corinthians 6.20. Yes, that's the word Exagorazo. Exa. Before Gorazo now. Exagorazo. It means to bring... Out of, to buy out of. Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us. He has purchased us out of the law. Out of the curse of the law. That means the curse of the law placed a price tag on those who were cursed. And Christ has paid. Hallelujah. Third word. Lutrao. Lutrao is like paying a ransom. Someone is held captive uh, to set the person free. You gotta pay a ransom. Lutra O L U T R A O. First Peter one eighteen. Hebrews nine fourteen uses the word Lutra O. I just give you one more. Is that last one for Sunday? Apolutrosis. Last one. Apolutrosis A P O. L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. A-P-O-L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. It means permanent freedom. Apollotrosis deals with freedom, just like Ultra O. It means to be set free, free, and free completely. Apollotrosis is a permanent freedom. Glory to God. Ephesians 1. Permanent freedom. Ephesians 1. Verse 7. Hallelujah. In whom we have permanent freedom through his blood. How does that sound? In whom we have permanent freedom through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Told you on Sunday, that was God's choice. He did it before we came on the scene. Hallelujah. It shows us in him before the foundation of the world before that we should be holy and blameless before him he love doesn't mean we're not going to steal it just means he has chosen to set us free completely from the guilt and the consequences of sin hallelujah glory to God that's why it says he has accepted us into his beloved how can you accept someone before he does anything that's the work of God. Before we did anything, He accepted us. Paul says He chose us. What chose means independent of any influence. Paul chose us. He said, In Him we have permanent, so I say permanent, permanent freedom. Colossians 1 14, not Colossians, Colossians 1 14. Colossians 1.14 Oh, to God. Thanks be unto God. What say? He says in whom we have permanent freedom through His blood even the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. In Christ, He says it's permanent freedom. Because Jesus, to your son, the Bible says, so that no flesh will glory in his presence. Nobody will have anything to say. First Corinthians 1, 29, said no flesh will glory in his presence. What's the word flesh? Man. No man will glory. Nobody will have anything to say. 
For him Christ Jesus has been made unto us redemption. Permanent freedom. I'm redeeming him. Hallelujah. What does that mean? If I stand before God, I'm permanently free to talk to God. Permanently free to relate with Him. That's what it means. So when He said to me, Adam, have you eaten of the fruits that I asked you not to eat? I was killed. Jesus condemnation of me. What does Jesus do? Jesus comes to remove condemnation forever in our relationship with God. There will never be condemnation between us and God anymore. Because Jesus' sacrifice is a total freedom. We have a God. Total. Not until the next scene. No. It's total. Hallelujah. So the book of Hebrews says it's an eternal redemption. Eternal freedom has been purchased. We have been purchased with an eternal hand. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So it's in Christ alone. Hallelujah. It's in Christ alone. It's in Christ alone. Salvation is in Christ alone. Amen. It's not in church attendance. It's not in prayer. It's good to pray. It's good to go to church. So that you can enjoy the benefits of your salvation. It's good to have Christian friends. Yep. It's good to do evangelism. But that's not the proof of your salvation. The proof of your salvation is with the Father. And He has come to live in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say in Christ alone. Thank God for Jesus' blessing. Give Him praise. Thank you. Glory to God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.